Hello and welcome to today's AgeWell Public Webinar Series, Designing to Include Dementia and Personhood. My name is Allison Schneider and I am the Education and Training Coordinator at AgeWell, whose vision is that Canada's leadership in technology and aging benefits the world. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that although we're meeting virtually, uh, AgeWell operates on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations, which have cared for the land uh, for thousands of years excuse me, including the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and Wendat peoples, and the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This land remains home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people, and is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Treaty, excuse me, the Wampum Treaty, which is an agreement uh, to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to work on this land today, and I wholeheartedly um, hope that you take a moment to encourage, or I encourage you, sorry, to take a moment to reflect upon the land in which you're located and consider your relationship to the land and to the people who are the traditional holders of that land. So before we launch into our session today, if we wanna to move to the next slide, uh, I just have a few words about AgeWell, who doesn't know us. So uh, AgeWell is Canada's technology and aging network. And our mission is to develop a community of researchers, older adults, caregivers, partners, and future leaders that accelerates the development of technology-based solution that make a meaningful difference in the lives of Canadians. As you can see on this slide, this translates into support for 250 researchers at uh, 48, we're missing one there, universities and research centers in Canada, over uh, 60 Canadian age tech startups, and over 5,000 engaged older adults and caregivers, many of whom are joining us today. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for playback on AgeWell's YouTube channel. Our speakers will be taking questions after their talk. Uh, you're invited to post any questions, comments, experiences in the chat or in the Q&A box. So now uh, I'll turn things over to Dr. Jennifer Boger. Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm sort of moderating slash leading the presentation today, but I by no means am the only person who contributed to today's topic and one of whom who we want to acknowledge right off the bat, whom a lot of people in AgeWell knew very well is our dear friend, Roger Marple. Roger was a person with lived experience in dementia and he was such an advocate and such an inspiration to everyone who met him really, including myself. He just had such a joie de vivre. He was larger than life. Um, and just really, he changed the way people think about what's possible with dementia and living well with dementia. So um, we really honor Roger's contribution to the project today. He was heavily involved in helping us design this guide for um, designing for people with dementia and personhood, but he also honestly just had a lasting impact on how we all conceptualize designing for dementia. So he's here with us um, in spirit as we present today. First of all, we want to go through and give a quick intro to um, ourselves. We are representing the crew who designed. There's actually 10 of us, I think, um, at the end of the day. So five of us are here. Uh, Luna, unfortunately, had a a health uh, incident and couldn't be with us today. So I'll be presenting a little bit on her behalf, um, just alphabetical order. So I'm going to start with myself since I have the BO. <laughs> oh, I just realized Ron is not alphabetical. Ron's actually before me. Anyway, I'll start <laughs> presenting. My name is Jennifer Boger. Um, I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Waterloo. My specialty is in designing technologies for supporting aging, and I'm very interested in all aspects of aging, not just health, but also like health is a big part of it, but also looking at things like well-being, um, leisure, social, all sorts of different aspects, as well as how do we better incorporate values, ethics, and needs, wants, 
preferences into technologies for supporting aging. So it's a very interesting and complex space between the technological challenge, but also this sort of social person challenge. Um, so that's where I'm coming from today. And I'm going to pass the mic to Ron uh, to do a quick introduction of himself. Hi, everyone. And Jen, you can always go first ahead of me. So um, <laughs> I'm good with that. My first name year, J comes before an R. So we'll, we'll do that here. Uh, but greetings, everyone. I'm Ron Valeno here in Toronto, uh, uh, Ontario. And uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, I myself uh, was a caregiver or a care partner uh, to a father that lived with dementia and Alzheimer's for over 10 years. Uh, he peacefully passed away back in 2018 at, at home, which was a challenge for us. Um, all our stories, all the knowledge that we gain uh, is quite important, especially to many of you also who are living uh, challenges of caregiving, of uh, offering care. And um, sharing that with the community is a big deal for me, is to make sure that uh, a lot of that is not wasted. And the ability to share our stories, uh, share those lessons uh, is uh, something that I push for, uh, you know, in, in the research community and the innovation community a lot. Um, so that's who I am um, as well, just a connection to AgeWell is that I co-chair uh, with Sherry Baker, who I believe Sherry Baker is also attending today, um, AgeWell's Older Adult and Caregiver Advisory Committee, uh, where we uh, try to push the voice of older adults and caregivers. So thanks again, everyone for coming by. And I'll pass it over to Jennifer Krull. Yes, I'm, I'm one of two Jennifers on this call. So I am the other Jennifer. I'm Jennifer Krull and I'm a user experience leader and strategist with Emetros, a small health technology company located in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. And in my role, I spend a lot of time thinking about how to craft positive experiences for users of digital health products. And in particular, in the last several years, I focused on how to design health and wellness products in a way that is inclusive of older adults and people living with dementia. So it's actually really exciting for me to be part of this project, and I'm excited to share some of what uh, some of what I've learned. And that's me. So I guess Jay is next. Yeah, yeah. I will take it from there. Again, it is great to be here. My name is Jay Reinstein. I am not in Canada. I am uh, here from Durham, North Carolina, and it's an honor to be here. Uh, at 61, uh, I am living with dementia, Alzheimer's disease. Was diagnosed at 57, and it was a huge punch in the gut for me because I love living life. I was a public servant for my entire career, and the diagnosis changed everything for me. And what it has enabled me to do is to advocate for uh, people living with Alzheimer's. And one of the things that I really try to do and try to drive home every chance I get is to do everything I can to reduce stigma, to let people know that a diagnosis isn't a death sentence and that I can be productive. And I often tell people I'm living well and I'm living, I'm living joyfully with this disease and I still can be productive. So I'm excited to be here today. And it's been just really a great opportunity to be involved in this project and to have a voice in the design of this manual. So I think I'm gonna turn it back to Jen. Thank you, Jay. And, and for the record, we're trying to get Jay up to a uh, age well conference in the fall. So <laughs> a pitch there, we're gonna, we're gonna lure him up to Toronto and uh, feed him a beaver tail. <laughs> I think we decided, yeah. Um, so the other speaker who is to be here today, Luna, she um, is a student at University of Waterloo and she's in knowledge integration and design. Um, and so she really was responsible for translating a lot of the thoughts that we're gonna share today into the actual design guides. So she had uh, a, a real role to play here. And we're really thankful for her input into this project too. I wish she could be here today and I know she wishes she could too. So without further ado, I'm just going to quickly share an overview of what the guide is and, and why we chose to do this and the impetus behind us. And then we're going to go through, we're going to take turns sort of talking a little bit about what resonates the most with us. Um, though to keep in mind when we do so, the guide is 
to be taken as a whole, but it doesn't mean you have to use every part of it equally much, but can pick and choose. Um, so the, the actual inspiration for this guide came from a capstone group I was working with as a professor at Waterloo. So in engineering, students have a, a eight month design project they have to do in their fourth year. And I had some bright fourth year engineering students come to me and they said, hey, we want to help people with dementia living in long term care. We want to help them uh, caregivers understand and communicate between transitions. So if they go to the hospital and come back so that they have ideas about who they are and preferences. I'm like, okay, great. This is amazing. Let's do this thing. And um, I, I hooked them up with uh, some people in long-term care at Schlegel villages in Waterloo. And when they started the project, they started talking a lot to caregivers there. And I'm like, well, why aren't you talking to people with dementia? And they had the classic, well, you know, by the time you get to long-term care, you know, you can't articulate preferences. And so I'm like, no, no, there are definitely ways. You just have to be creative and work with people to see what they can and can't do. And over the eight months, they, I, and I, I applaud them for the effort they put in. They got sucked right in. And by the end, they were designing right with people with moderate to severe levels of dementia by looking, presenting them with the tech they built, sitting with them, watching what they could and couldn't do, and figuring out ways to design the interface where people could make choices through a design interface that was more appropriate for them to directly start conveying some of the things that they felt and thought about themselves and what they wanted people to know about themselves. And it was really pivotal for them. And they basically said, man, I wish there was a guide that people could use to start thinking about how to design with this population, not just for them, but with them in a way that kind of got people started thinking about taking what they know about design and how to kind of augment it with tips and tricks for doing better with this population. So that's really where this guide came from. And that's, that's the real impetus behind it. I'm like, that's a fantastic idea, let's do this. And so uh, the team who are presenting today, um, plus a few other people who are not here today uh, from all sorts of different walks of life. So we have uh, three people with lived experience, Jay, um, as well as Roger and Athena were that side of it, Jim Kroll, who's with industry designing for dementia, myself as an adjunct, uh, Luna and Hillary are both in knowledge translation, really helped with the design of the package, and Ron, who's really um, this guy who has experience in almost every aspect of it <laughs> there. Um, kind of putting in his two cents. So really proud of the team and proud of the product that came out of it. And what we really want this guide to be first and foremost is just that. We want it to be something that's accessible by not just designers, it's not just for designers. This is also for people living with dementia. So that both stakeholders are able to interact with the guide, and both stakeholders are able to share the guide with each other. So that if you're a designer for dementia and you want to kind of figure out some ways that we can do this better, you could share this guide with people that you wanna design with and say, hey, does this resonate with you? How can we help you do things uh, around design so that we can design together and vice versa if you're someone living with dementia and someone comes to you saying, hey, I want to work with you, you can be like, read this guide first and then come back and let's talk about some of the things in it. So with that preface, I want to actually jump into the guide itself a little bit. <laughs> um, let me see here. I need to just share a different screen. So hopefully you can all see the guide now. Um, and there's a link to this guide at the I think in the chat and at the end of the presentation, but you can always, you know, shoot a message to any one of us. Um, it's available online. It's hosted at the Research Institute for Aging. And it really gives an overview of why 
we should design um, for dementia and personhood. So it's not just designing to support dementia, but also supporting the person because you know, dementia is one part of who that person is. It's not the entirety of the person. And that's what a message that we really wanted to get across is don't just think about how to support dementia, think about how to support this person in their entirety as a person. Um, so we go through a little bit on what is dementia, what is personhood. Um, we've got these wonderful quotes from people. Um, I need your empathy and understanding, not your assumptions. That was from Roger. <laughs> and there's Jay's quote, doing whatever I can to reduce stigma and a purpose-filled life. So resonates with your intro there, Jay. <laughs> um, and it just has some from material to kind of set a tone or a feel for designing with dementia. Then we dive into some key mindsets. And the idea here is these are mindsets that you layer on top of best design practices. So this doesn't mean that everything people learned about design goes out the window. This just means in addition to everything you've learned, pay attention to these specific things because they're really important when working with this population. So nothing for us without us is a thing we're hearing a lot of. Um, so we're saying collaborate with people. Again, don't design for them, design with them. Build background, learn about the person. Again, learn about the person, not just their diagnosis and focus on them as a person and not as a disease. Um, foster trust, so building trust with people so that there's mutual trust on both sides. Because speaking candidly is honestly quite important to get design right. Embracing that dementia is dynamic. One day is maybe not like another day and that people change um, over the long term as well as fluctuate day to day, just like anyone else. Frankly, I have my on days and off days too. I don't know anyone who doesn't. Um, to be patient, I think this is another good one. Let's just, <laughs> it doesn't matter who you are. Giving people time and space to gather and express their thoughts. Budgeting extra time so that if it takes people extra time to do things, they don't feel rushed or hurried. Being flexible about your approach, as well as um, listening to people about how they would like to engage with dementia design being open-minded, that's a big one um, that we've touched on already, and being respectful, treating people as people. We go through, again, some user recommendations to help designers and people living with dementia be on the same page for when they first start engaging and for discussions to make that process a little smoother. So before, during, and after discussions around design, and then we have some general design recommendations, just as kind of quick start ideas, much more in the digital context, but um, it can apply to any sort of product as well. And then we have um, basically some resources that people can look at to learn more um, about, and then a bit of backstory and who created it. So, uh, that's sort of a quick overview of the guide. Um, but what I really want to get into is, is, is people's feelings as to on this call, the people, the creators of the guide, you know, what inspired you to get into this and what's sort of your favorite part or take home message from the guide that you, you'd love people to really think about. So we're going to start off with Jay. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And again, um, first of all, it was really an honor to, to have a voice in this process. And one of the things that I think it's really important for organizations, anyone to really be thinking about is trying to avoid tokenism. You know, uh, don't, don't be that organization to check that box. I want to have a voice and be involved in a process. And I'm just gonna just go back quickly a couple of years ago, I was involved in a project and they were very excited to have me involved to help. And I spent several weeks just talking back and forth 
But at the end of the day, I don't think they were really interested in my voice. I think they were really more interested in saying that, hey, we got a, had, we had a guy who had dementia who was there helping us. And I think that really sort of set the tone. And it really was something that sort of stood out for me is what not to do. Um, experience I have had being on a team and not soliciting my input was very hurtful. But I think what's, what folks often have to think about is how productive we can be. You know, there are things that I'm unable to do now, like I was able to do before my diagnosis, but my voice and my ideas can add a great deal of value to any project. And my perspective, in my opinion, and I think in others, can be invaluable as the team begins to develop a manual, a document, a website. Um, some folks, I think, are really hesitant at first, and maybe it's the unknown about working with someone who has dementia or Alzheimer's. They're just really not sure how to have that conversation. But I can assure you with me and with others that I've met along my journey, we want to be included. And myself, I have very thick skin, but I'd rather you ask me questions that may be difficult than just ignore me totally. You know, I try and I think I, I try to do a good job of being involved and reducing stigma. So many folks immediately make a judgment when they hear dementia, a person with dementia, Alzheimer's. They think about that final stage, that end stage when people really aren't functioning. Let's, let's sort of change that narrative and think about the earlier stages. I'm 61, I was diagnosed at 57. I can still do a lot. I have trouble reading books because I can't retain. I have difficulty with short-term memory, but there are a lot of things I can do. And I think once you get to know the person and the capabilities, they can really add a lot of value. As I said earlier, I think in my thing, the, the diagnosis isn't a death sentence. And I think we have the opportunity, hopefully, to change opinions of so many. And I was so honored, and I really mean this, to take part in the designing of this manual because they listened to me. They asked questions. I gave feedback. It was genuine. And team members, I don't think, at least on this team, didn't make any assumptions about me. They were always very patient. Patience is huge, which, which Jen talked about earlier. There was a focus, I think, which is ultimately the key is building that trusting relationship with that individual because we're sort of going into the unknown. When you build that trust, that's huge, and you're going to have a more productive team and a better end product. Um, uh, something that I've always thought about in my career in management is showing appreciation and appreciate what we're doing. You know, let us know that, hey, what you did was, was really helpful. And with the understanding, all of my ideas are not gonna necessarily be incorporated. And, and let me know that on the front end, just because I say something, it doesn't mean it's the great idea, but it gives me that opportunity to have a voice. Um, and just the collaboration, the collaborative effort, working with that individual with dementia is huge. And I think you'll be much more successful. Finally, as I said earlier, you know, the team members, at least this team, were so genuine and showed so much appreciation. And I really felt when I looked at this end product that my ideas were incorporated. And that made me feel great. I mean, it really did. It, it made me realize that they were listening. Um, and um, hopefully that that end product was really reflective of personhood. So I want to sort of leave it on that. And um, I hope it was helpful. So uh, I think I'm going to turn it back to, to Jen. Well, that's high praise. Thank you, Jay. We were honored <laughs> to have you. So the feeling is very mutual. <laughs> um, next up is Ron. Ron, what's your favorite aspect of designing for dementia and personhood? Uh, before I comment on that, I just wanted to make a quick comment, Jay. So, you know, thank you for sharing, you know, that the team was listening, uh, was uh, valuing, you know, your your comments, your ideas, uh, that it's not simply about uh, tokenism, okay, that we just check, you know, hey, we got someone on the list. So that's appreciated. But what's also important that people should also be aware of is 
this example today is that also being that voice on the other end to share the work, uh, to make sure it's more powerful in my personal opinion, if it comes from, let's say your voice, Jay. Uh, I love you both Jennifer's, but Jay to me is that voice that we really do need and always wherever we can. So uh, thanks on that. So for me, uh, I picked uh, from, from this, uh, which I always love to talk about is how do you connect with people? So build background. Uh, learn about the people you are designing for in a non-clinical way, okay? So many times, um, especially with students, um, as they learn, uh, they come to me, uh, you know, Ron, you lived with dementia. Uh, what were your problems, okay? Sometimes the questions are not powerful, okay, and not specific enough. It's kind of like, you know, how is your life with dementia? It's a good start. But that ability to get to the next stage to connect better, um, to relate better, is is what I really appreciate about this. It's not simply um, having just uh, a survey. Okay, surveys are okay. Um, there is a place for surveys. It's not simply having just a focus group. Those are a little better. You could kind of go back and forth in the conversations, but it's it's about connecting in a way where you actually understand that individual, okay, that group that you're speaking to or you're connecting with. And it can be done in many other ways than just uh, a survey, okay, or um, a lot of it is getting that a few people on your team ahead of time to help co-design. So Mary, um, you know, Mary Hines put in the chat, that's exactly what, you know, one of the reasons we're doing this, okay, is that co-design piece, okay. And co-design also means making sure that that power balance, okay, with the voices at the table um, to support Jay, you know, person living with dementia, to support that. Don't pick Ron. Ron is actually uh, at a different level, but with many caregivers, care partners that are coming on board, okay, to say, hey, we need your voice. Okay, don't be shy. Okay, uh, discuss with us. You know, don't be afraid to tell us that what we're doing is not great. Okay, so it's that ability to make people feel relaxed. Um, I'm going to mention... You know, you know, one of the ways I like to do it is to break bread, to have meals, okay? That is one of my techniques is to say, hey, can we go for a coffee? Uh, can we casually have this conversation in, you know, over a meal, whatever that is? Because I believe those are the spaces you could intimately do a deeper dive in those conversations, okay? It's not simply, I'm just reading from a checklist to ask you on, okay? I need to have a communication skill or communication skills uh, with the other people that I'm working with and also with us uh, to kind of not just listen, but I'm also going to throw out to understand body language, okay? Body language, we give off a lot of communication tips to there, okay? And if you're kind of seeing, you know, frowns or if you're seeing, you know, uh, ways where we get excited, okay? That's where you probe further, okay? So it's that ability also to, to listen and observe, okay? And just one last point is what I'm going to say is get better at powerful questions, okay? Uh, questions is a skill to ask, um, you know, what are those questions? Not just questions about the work, but to ask questions around that. Um, one way I like to ask questions is to kind of get into emotions, okay? How do you feel about this path that we're doing? How, how are you going to feel, you know, Jay, if we bring you on board to be in this presentation? Are you comfortable with that? Okay. And if Jay says, well, I feel scared, or I said, I'm excited, then you can go backwards and probe and say, oh, what are you excited about? Or what, you know, are you fearful about? So that's some of the tips that I want to throw out to the group here and uh, to get better at listening, watching, and also sometimes using your gut. What's the feeling that you're getting from this conversation that you're having or that connection, whether that's even on Zoom or in person? So those are some of my thoughts, but uh, doesn't have to always be in a clinical format. It's sometimes better to be very casual. So those are some of the tips. Back to you, Jen. Thank you, Ron. I, I love that. It's, <laughs> it, it's in line with one of my favorite design questions, which is what makes you swear? That's what I, <laughs> that I love asking people when we're trying to design something. That, that one always has very fruitful information that comes from it. And swearing, what makes you swear? That's opportunity. That's the smell of opportunity when it comes to technology. Uh, I'm going to just make one little comment. I know we're going to be talking a little bit more about Roger, but
but you knew Roger Marple, okay, when he was on some of the teams, is when even with me, with you know, he, he would give me the finger in front of the group, let's say the bird, okay, the <laughs> middle finger to say, what the hell, Rod? You know, where are you going with this? Or something like that. That is a deeper dive conversation, in my opinion. So yeah, yeah. Uh, you never had to really wonder what Roger was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Ron. Um, so Luna, again, yeah, she can't be with us today, unfortunately, but I know she'd want to be. And um, while she wasn't able to feed us a, a thought, I mean, she, this is something that she told me multiple times while she was working on the guide. So um, I feel pretty confident in saying so, something Luna learned as she worked with all of us and through doing the guide itself um, is that a big takeaway of working with people living with dementia in ways that are collaborative is that you go from ideas to a design that's accessible by many. And so that's a challenge we put in front of people where designing for dementia and personhood doesn't always mean designing specifically for dementia, but rather designing products that are inclusive of people living with dementia. So they're products that pull people living with dementia into that uh, societal space, enabling them to participate fully or more fully as people um, sharing a product. Um, so that's something that I know she took away from this. And she said, you know, that will be with her for the rest of her design career. So yay, um, is every time she designs a product, she's going to be thinking of how do I make this particular product inclusive of people living with dementia as well. So um, really wonderful to hear. And she's really super at what she does. So I have no doubt that that's going to have, you know, uh, sort of thinking around why design for dementia is a bit of a ripple effect where it doesn't mean it's a one-off, but once you learn these skills, every time you design a product, um, whether it's intended for people with dementia or not, that's always gonna be in your mind as a group that you consider, can that population access this? What does that mean to them? Um, and hopefully include them wherever possible. Oh, and so I guess I'm next. <laughs> So um, for, for myself, the thing that I like most um, about designing for dementia and personhood is being open-minded. Um, I try to be open-minded every time I come to the table. And every time I come to the table, I learn so much every time. And even if it's with people that I've been working with before, sometimes for years, um, every time it just... It's very inspiring and and often, you know, something honestly that happens for me, I'm surprised more by people, what people can do and what people are willing to do than I am by what they can't. But you only see that when you are open minded and try to toss your biases away and um, just really sit and listen and empathize and try to see things from their perspective and really hear their stories and then think about how the product can do better for them, not for you or your uh, preconceptions or impressions. Um, it's something that's a little tricky to do sometimes. And certainly when you're first learning design, it can be hard to, you know, really listen to what someone is telling you, but you really do learn so much and it makes it a lot more fun, honestly because it does broaden your mind and it triggers ideas. That's where like bar none, a lot of the most brilliant stuff we, I've done with my research teams is because it was inspired by someone's real need or ideas. Because if you're living with this every day, you get ideas about what a solution might look like and you can articulate when someone solved a problem. So, um, that's that's my number one takeaway is to be open minded and you can you can never do that too much and it, it's like it's like golf or sailing or anything else that's hard you can never master it um, but you can always get better at it so 
And Jen, I think we saved the best for last, maybe. <laughs> well, mine ties in very closely with Luna. So I think this is a really nice follow on to that. And I'm, I'm coming at this from a perspective of a designer or a user experience practitioner. And on the first page of the guide, there's a line that reads solve for one, extend to many. And I really think this statement reflects my favorite aspect of designing for dementia and personhood. So working with people with dementia to design useful and usable products has actually taught me how much what I call designing for intention matters and how designing with intention can create better experiences, not only for people with dementia, but also for others. And so when I say designing with intention, what I mean by that is that we actually take, uh, we actually take time when we're when we're including people with dementia we take time to consider what really matters so we maybe put a little bit more effort into making our user interfaces a little more clean a little more simple reducing noise and clutter using plain language and chunking content appropriately creating consistency in the interaction experience using familiar user interface patterns and some of these ideas are reflected in the guide focusing on ease of use and findability of functions and content. And when we put in that effort, I think we make our products more accessible and easier to use for others as well. And I would say beyond that, that this idea of designing with intention extends also to user experience research. So user experience research is the kind of research that we as user experience practitioners out in the field undertake with users or potential users of our products to help us identify opportunities, as Jen said, and ways that we can make the products that we design more useful, more usable, and how we can really hit the mark for the people we're looking to support. When we take the time to consider how to engage people with dementia meaningfully and respectfully, that's important, in our user experience research, we're actually taking time to consider how to craft more comfortable and positive experiences with research for a broader range of people. So for example, providing flexibility around where and how research is conducted, uh, creating a comfortable research environment that's free of distractions, setting clear expectations so people know what to expect, and even just basic things like being patient and kind. We've heard patience. I think everybody has mentioned patience. Um, kind, being genuine, uh, listening actively and fostering trust and so on and so on, just those basic things. Can also make research sessions more comfortable and positive for other research participants. I mean, how many of us like to know in advance, for example, what to expect when, uh, when we're doing something that maybe we haven't done before or appreciate flexibility and respect for our time or kindness or feeling heard and understood. So I really appreciated the opportunity working with this group to create uh, this designing to include dementia and personhood guide and to share some of what I've learned through working with older adults and, uh, and people with dementia. And I've learned a lot just as Jen, as Jen has. And, and when we can create these positive experiences, particularly around research sessions, people feel more relaxed and actually it becomes a whole lot more fun um, because we actually really get to engage in a deeper way. Um, so I'm really pleased to see this guide come to life. And I hope that it will be useful to others, not only as a guide for designing to include people with dementia and personhood, but also as a reminder to all user experience practitioners, myself included, to take the time to consider how we might be more intentional in our user experience design and research practices. And that's what I wanted to share today. That was amazing. Yeah, intentional, that, that's a... That's a really great way to put it. Intentional, just doing anything intentionally is fantastic. But I agree, it, it does. It fosters mindfulness in how you approach design. So thanks, Jen. That was that was really awesome. Actually, the the best word for last is what would Roger say? <laughs> so so when we were putting together the webinar, we were trying to think of how do we include Roger in this? Because he really, he was really with us every step of the way. He was one of the core designers of this. Um, 
lots of meetings between him, myself, Luna, Ron, um, and everyone else. But he was there reading it over and over and really having a say in it and, you know, connecting us with other people. He thought Jay came through a connection from Roger, um, you know, people he thought would be interested and would contribute and want to contribute. So here we, we decided to do a round robin of what would Roger say um, if he were here and what we imagine he'd want to say or tell us in the presentation. So um, we can, I guess, go in the same sort of order. Maybe, Jay, do you want to start? What do, you, what do you think Roger would say if he were here with us today presenting with us? I, I think he'd be very colorful. Uh, with his language, as he always was, but I think he would say something like, our voices were really heard. Yeah. I'm going to miss the guy, too. He was, I mean, he did introduce me to you all, but uh, uh, I won't say much other than he was a special person, and um, uh, I just really enjoyed my time talking to Raj. Miss him. I'll miss him terribly. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Jen, I have a question for Jay, because Jay, I know Roger was really connected to the community, specifically on Twitter, online. So I'm not sure how you and Roger met, uh, but how those living with dementia inspire each other, right? You know, like, I yeah. think you've been inspired by Roger. Uh, many will be inspired by you, okay? Um, so I'm just curious about that connection and that community. Uh, yeah, colorful. Roger and I, I never use the word colorful, but that's a great word now that I think of it. Yeah, yeah. We we were involved in a project together. Um, and we just sort of hit it off. His great sense of humor, but he he shared some experiences with me that helped me along my journey and uh gave me some really good advice. Uh, but I think the one thing about Roger, he he said it like it was. You know, there was no beating around the bush. And I appreciated that, you know, um, and he did stuff with a great sense of humor. So um, he was really good for our group, the other group that I was involved in. And he was sort of the, I, I'd look at him as our leader in a sense. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely. I agree with everything you're saying, <laughs> including going to miss him a lot. I do miss him a lot. Um, Ron, what, what do you think Roger would say if he were presenting with us today? Yeah, so Roger has a lot to say depending on the theme or the topic of the day. Even if he has no knowledge about it, he will have something to say about it. That, that's Roger there. Um, just before I give a couple more thoughts on that, I just wanted people to know, know that in the chat, Allison did post... Um, uh, a virtual event that we are having tomorrow for one hour, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, even though Roger passed away back in October last year, um, we are just going to be doing the celebration tomorrow, which will include family, uh, this community, of course, uh, many others around the world that will be popping in as well. And we'll be sharing some thoughts, some stories um, about Roger there. Uh, so for me, um, what I have to say uh, with regarding Roger quickly here is that um, I want to focus on his love to support trainees and students that are the next group coming up that are learning. OK, so Jennifer Boger here, I don't count you in that group at this stage anymore. Um, you know, I to me, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm picking the ones that are still taking classes that are doing, you know, their their degrees and all that that Roger really had a passion for many of you who are online here, okay, at least a dozen or two of you, I can tell us, I know that our trainees, early uh, career, um, you know, um, researchers as well, that he wanted to make sure that whatever he said, just as you said, Jay, creates that impact to move the work forward faster, okay, that we're not just spending time working, that it's actually to move it faster. So that's what I remember of Roger, that people will feel it. And as you do your work, um, it, it's one of those where if you have that emotional attachment, I'm coming back to the emotions, somehow you will have a little bit more passion or desire to say, hey, Roger, we want to make your life better. Jay, 
you know, we want your life better. To all the care partners and caregivers here, okay, we want to make your life better. So that's what I always felt that Roger brought that that emotional piece that said, hey, we're cheering for this work and we want to make sure we do our best. Even if we fail, we want to make sure we kind of have that purpose to do the work in a different way because we heard Roger's voice and Jay's voice and the others. So that's what I always got from Roger there. Yeah, love it. Thanks, Ron. Absolutely. He wasn't he wasn't afraid of a brave space, <laughs> a brave new space, a brave one. Jen, what, what, what about you? What do you think Roger would say if he were here today? So mine is less about what I think Roger would say and uh, more about what I think Roger would do. And I think that uh, that perhaps he might raise a butter tart to this guy. Or several. <laughs> or several. Yeah. It's worthy of that, I feel. It is. It is. Yeah. For those who are not in the know, Roger was a butter tart fanatic and and he was interviewed once um, as a person living with dementia and during the interview, he was baking and making butter tarts. And so he has a coveted butter tart recipe. And so, yeah, he's now known as the butter tart guy is one of his many, his many, um, mis, mis, I don't know if misnomer is the right word, one of his many nicknames, let's put it that way. Um, what would Roger say if he were here? I think he'd be proud of how the guide, well, I know he was proud of how the guide really tried to tackle stigma and just cut it off before it even reared its head and to really try and get people to forget what they think they knew or, or, or their preconceptions, many of which are you know in popular culture they're not exactly the most positive or inspiring kind of ideas around what dementia is i think that's something he just he was such an advocate on and he was very vocal on <laughs> um but but for a good reason you know he challenged a lot of people and he wasn't afraid to when he saw that they were stigmatizing or making preconceptions about what dementia was and was not. And so I know he poured a lot of passion while we were creating in the guide to really help us craft it in a way that was respectful in a way that was authentic. So um, I think that's something he would say if he were here is the guide really helps people to, on both sides to try and um, break down stigma because one of his things about stigma too is the stigma around researching and how research can feel scary or research can deter a lot of people who have valuable things to say and would enjoy it from actually engaging with it and so stigma on both sides I think yeah ah, take a breath and on that note <laughs> um we'd love to open the floor to uh some Q&A. So we'd love to hear your thoughts about um, if you have any questions about the guide or observations or just anything you want to share with us, please do so. We'd love to hear what you think. And we have a few minutes um, to do some um, chatting there. So please do post in the chat if you have any questions or any observations. I just wanted to start with a question I received. It's Allison from AgeWell. Um, and as people are typing their questions in the chat, I'll give them some time to think. Um, but I did receive a question from a young researcher or a new researcher who's wondering um, about recruiting. I know this is outside the scope of the guide, but what are some um, good strategies to uh, recruit uh, people who are living with dementia? Mm. I think this is one where we might do a, a quick round robin on it as well, because we all have sort of different perspectives. My first and foremost yeah. is do not treat them like guinea pigs. A lot of people go to, and this is human participants in general, um, they'll go to try to recruit for um, a study and expect people to just kind of sign up, participate and go away. So that, that's not terribly helpful. You know, you have to really think about how you're going to compensate people adequately and appropriately for their time and for their efforts. Um, and also, you, you just need to take the time to build up a rapport 
with the people you're doing relationship or the research with um, and how much of the rapport depends on the type. But matching, matching that is really important. Um, and again, the other one is actually with recruitment, often through getting ethics, really ensuring that you set up your study and get it through ethics in a way that allows people living with dementia to decide for themselves whether they want to participate or not, and not making assumptions a priori about whether they want to participate or not, but making rather making the study and designing it in a way that they have the choice, that they are fully informed and they can make decisions and give consent as to whether to participate or not. Um, I'm going to follow on to that, Jen, if that's okay. I think it's really important uh, to also foster trust with organizations that you can work with. So for example, uh, you know, dementia advocacy groups, um, you know, looking at other organizations that support people with dementia, but you can't just go and say, hey, I'm looking for your people. Um, there is an element of relationship building there as well, where there, there is an element of, of uh, you know, showing that, that, that you're, you're trustworthy and, and working with those organizations, volunteering with those organizations, um, you know, supporting in other ways, these are all great ways to support recruitment. Yeah, I would just add one thing. Uh, I mean, in the US, one of the things that folks have done is reached out to the uh, local chapters like the Alzheimer's Association and built those relationships there if they have a special project and sort of you know, go from there because usually there are a lot of from support groups to the actual chapters usually uh, can identify folks that may have an interest in participating in a certain project. But it does take that trust and relationship building to to uh, make that happen. Um, I also find it sorry, I'm just going to add one more thing, but I also find it's helpful to have uh, you know, someone with uh, lived experience with dementia to also uh, support recruitment efforts. So uh, through an organization, um, you know, maybe sending out a Twitter or a Facebook or something, um, just so that again, it's building trust. It's I know this person and uh, and so on. So yeah, I know Jennifer Curl. That's yeah, having uh, a Jay or Ron or others, you know, part of that process. That's included in the co-design piece. Uh, recruitment uh, part. So for me, I'll just give some practical tips around recruitment. Uh, recruitment is one of the most difficult things right now, uh, especially over the past few years, because most of it now has to be done online. And you are going to miss a population that doesn't have access to digital uh, means. But just let's say for now, digitally, uh, many uh, do not put a landing page, a simple page that we go to. A lot of it is just uh, a flyer with a text. Okay, So I'm suggesting create a landing page and I'm encouraging a lot to start doing short little videos um, of that. So it's not all about reading that, that we could read it. Jay and Ron can say, okay, sorry, not that we can read it, that we could feel it in the video, okay, that we can trust, okay? You know, um, sometimes a 30 second to one minute video is more powerful than us reading one or two pages of, okay, this is just words, what does this mean here, okay? So that's one of my tips around recruitment. You, it's pretty much increasing the odds of success. That's what you're, you're battling there. Great, thank you so much. Those are really excellent uh, tips for our um, new re researchers. So there's a couple of questions here uh, that Amy has posted that I think um, are really great. Um, so I'll get, get to her first one. Um, she says, thank you, as we've had a couple of um, other comments thanking our presenters as well. Um, and she asks, how and where are you disseminating or sharing the guide? And secondly, will you evaluate its uh, research or impact or reach or impact, excuse me? Good question, Jamie. So <laughs> uh, here's the link to the guide. It's actually posted through the Research Institute for Aging because they supported design of it. And so they're posting it now off their site, but it's available for anyone who would like to uh, use it. So please share widely with anyone and everyone you think might be interested. Um, I know Roger was also, he really wanted to get it through WHO, the World Health Organization. They have um, support for dementia kind of tools that they give the thumbs up to. And he was on a group that reviewed those. Um, so that's something else I intend to follow 
through with and try to get it through there as well so it has more exposure. Um, so hopefully that answers the first question. The second one, if we're going to evaluate it, unfortunately not. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I just, I don't have funds to do that with, but if that's something that you'd be interested in doing, do let me know, and I'm happy to um, support anyone who'd like to kind of take that on. I'd, I'd love to do that, honestly. Um, if I had a big bag of money and all the time in the world, I'd love to take the guide and actually try it out in practice in a lot of different projects and contexts, and then take all that feedback back and like do the you know guide 2.0 um, based on how how that went and people's experiences actually using it in the field. So thank you for those questions. Those are great. Sounds like another partnership forming. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to jump to Amy's second question because I think this um, will apply to a number of our speakers. Um, Amy was wondering how that um, how to uh, empathetically and appropriately end a research engagement, like a study, in a way that honors the relationship built with any knowledge users. So do you have any recommendations as far as that goes? And she's wondering about um, how we can guide uh, students when they're ending that re research awesome relationship. Uh, uh, Jen or Jade, do you guys want to jump in on that one? Uh, sometimes in the past, what I've done is, uh, you know, um, offering to follow up with uh, how the feedback that uh, folks have provided actually ended up having an impact in some way. And I have done that. Of course, it's important then to follow through <laughs> if you say that. Um, but that way, you know, you're, you, you have this relationship with this person and then you can share with them the impact of that um, after the fact. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that if, if, recruitment often happens through organizations like the Alzheimer's Society or, or and you continue to be involved with those organizations, you're going to continue to see some of the folks that you work with um, after your research ends as well. Do you have anything to add, Jay? Or The only thing that I would say is after the project concluded, you know, one of the things that I try to do is being that I'm on several boards is sharing the information with the boards and trying to get the word out with the Alzheimer's Association with Voices of Alzheimer's and seeing if we can push it out on social media. And that's what we've tried to do. So to continue the conversation and hopefully uh, uh, get the information out to, to others. Awesome, thank you. I think Allison, we're at time, aren't we? We're getting pretty close, so I, I hesitate to address another question. Um, and it looks like people are kind of signing off as they as they head to their next um, meeting. So if we wouldn't mind advancing to the next slide, um, I'm just going to post uh, in the chat uh, the link to this event next week uh, for those who are interested in what's happening in Atlantic Canada. This is for everyone across Canada to attend. Um, you can register and learn more about some of the uh, age tech uh, related research and programs and organizations in Atlantic Canada and there will be time uh, for networking after the one hour presentation. Uh, thanks so much, Jen. Um, and if uh, I'm sorry, I think I cut you off. Did you have any uh, last words? I'll leave it with you, Jen. Uh, no, just thanks everyone for coming and a special thank you to the co presenters that for their time and knowledge today. Um, I really, I really love how the guide turned out. And I actually, I really enjoyed our conversation today, genuinely. So wonderful to see everyone here. And thanks everyone for your time who came and listened to our webinar today as well. And, and a big thank you to Allison and Allie and Agewell for, for doing such a great job hosting. So thanks everyone and have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Thanks so much. On behalf of Joel, thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.